The submarine began to sink and the rushing waves closing in over my dome triggered a claustrophobic panic. I'd spent the past several years traveling on ships all across the globe, but I'd never boarded a submarine until now. Was there really enough air in my compartment? What would I do if the seal popped again and I was flooded with pure oxygen far from the ship? Josefar turned on the thrusters propelling the submarine downward. Suddenly, the underwater space seemed vast, neck snapping my claustrophobia to agoraphobia. I felt naked and small in a huge, murky, and foreign world. Slowly, my fears gave way to awe. As I looked up through the glass bubble, the sea surface glistened in the sun, a shimmering of glassy blues. It was louder than I expected in the compartment and the growl of the engine and the sound of the air scrubbers removing carbon dioxide from the cabins. I checked my watch. About two minutes had passed. The sweat on my neck began to dry and the compartment felt cool and comfortable. The prehensile arm of the rover extended out in front of us outfitted with a high-definition underwater camera. Lamps on either side of the rover stabbed into the gloom as we slowly descended. It took about 15 minutes for the sub to dive 315 feet to the ocean floor. A skate with a four-foot wingspan glided by, and neon-colored fish darted to and fro. We passed over arrow crabs, giant lobster, and brittle starfish. Though we were not in the Amazon plume, visibility varied drastically, not unlike passing through clouds in an airplane. One second, we could see nothing. The next moment, there was sparkling clarity. A school of long gray suckerfish, or remoras, charged the submarine trying to latch onto us as they do whales and sharks. A six inch long whitefish moved in and out of a hole in the seafloor. Over the radio, Josefar noted that fish was called a slippery dick after its reputation for escaping nets and fishermen's hands. We approached what from afar, it looked simply like a pile of craggy rocks, but as we neared, I found myself leaning into a Lilliputian metropolis, bustling and vibrant with electric blues, oranges, and yellows. The Amazon reef spread all around us as the rotoliths fused together. They form larger structures that create the skeleton of the reef itself. Over the course of several dives, Greenpeace would map the undersea reef, discovering its contours and filming much of its 600 miles from the mouth of the Amazon to French Guinea. In every direction, the lamps illuminated some new strange evidence of biodiversity as the sub circled and rose, following the contours of the seafloor. Sometimes, the light from above would reach us and glimmer across the ocean floor. As I looked out at the teeming world around us, I knew I would never again dismiss corals as merely glamorized rocks. We began our ascent. Through the glass dome, I looked up as we approached the stained glass window of the surface. I felt a certain euphoria from having visited this vulnerable and foreign world, populated by creatures that didn't fit neatly into our usual animal mineral plant categories. I was also reminded that it's tough to make people want to protect what they never have seen. <laughs>